indicative of the leaders of the Arab world. Andrew, let me also ask you about Secretary of State Colin Powell. I know he is on his way back from Lima, Peru. He was scheduled to be in Bogota, Colombia, but he decided obviously to return to the United States. Can you tell us his plans and when he is expected to reach Washington, if in fact that is where he's headed? We believe he was headed to Florida and then we think from Florida on to Washington. Uh, one of the things that happened in Lima, Peru before he left was a strong statement by Colin Powell uh, saying that these terrorists can attack our buildings, they can uh, kill, they can maim, they can destroy, but they cannot destroy the American spirit. They cannot destroy the United States of America. A very stern and angry Colin Powell at the Organization of American States in Lima, Peru today. All right, Andrea Mitchell, State Department correspondent in our Washington bureau this afternoon. Andrea, thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. And Katie, we have word now, according to the AP, that approximately 100 people are confirmed dead in the attack on the Pentagon early this morning. We're not clear as to whether that number includes the number of people who are on the jetliner that was crashed into that building. But again, the AP is now reporting that approximately 100 people were killed in the Pentagon prong of this four-prong attack. We should mention 64 people were aboard that plane that crashed into the Pentagon. 27 people have been taken to a hospital in Arlington, Virginia. Eight others who had been injured to a Washington hospital as well. Do we have Ken Allard on the phone now? In the studio. Oh, there we go. Ken, Ken is an international terrorism expert. Ken, good morning to you. Good afternoon to you. Excuse me. How are you, Matt? Uh, I'm fine, thank you. When, when you hear the U.S. officials saying they are already looking in the direction of Osama bin Laden, do you think they're looking in the right place? I think so. Matt, I mean, the sophistication of this attack, uh, the fact that it was elaborately planned, flawlessly executed, uh, and as audaciously conceived as it was, all that evidence points in one direction. So until something else happens, you clearly look for your leading suspect, that's Osama bin Laden. And for Americans who had, I guess, enjoyed some sense of security, thinking that perhaps Osama bin Laden and his uh, organizers and, and compatriots were operating oh in other places, it appears that this oh had to have been organized, at least with great help, inside oh our own borders. Matt, that's probably one of the most worrying aspects of this, because it has been an article of oh faith God. among U.S. counterintelligence people that uh, operating oh inside the United States was something that was difficult, maybe even impossible. Uh, among the other things that came down today, along with those buildings, uh, were those preconceptions. We now know that he has been able to operate successfully inside this country, and that indeed he has a support network here. That's going to be a very tough thing to go in and root out. And staying on that subject, when we talk about a massive intelligence breach here, the fact that no intelligence picked up a warning that this attack may have been coming. It's one thing if, if our intelligence overseas missed this. It's another thing if our intelligence right here in the United States missed it. Well, the thing that is, I think, going to really tell the tale here uh, is precisely the effort to find out what did our intelligence agencies know and when did they know it? What did they pass along? Uh, we've been saying all day that it is very, very reminiscent you know, of the attack on Pearl Harbor. And after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Guess what we did? We went back and found out that, yes, the evidence was there. We should have known. And again, I think what we're going to see, even in this instance, this Pearl Harbor of the 21st century, is very much the same kind of thing. And Ken, let's, let's explain the difference here. People are already saying that we have perhaps too much technical intelligence and not enough human intelligence. Describe the difference and how each would be used. Well, basically, it's the difference between getting intelligence by machines, mostly satellites, eavesdropping, and that kind of thing, from the very nitty-gritty business that obtains when you're doing human intelligence, i.e. spies, and counterintelligence. And all that basically means is that you are going out, you're penetrating those organizations so that when they are planning an attack, you've got somebody on the, on the inside. It is a very tough, very dirty business, but it's the kind of thing that you have to do. And for the last 20 years in our intelligence establishment, we've not done nearly enough to train and acquire the kinds of people that can give us that kind of intelligence. And again, now we find out just how desperately that kind of information is needed. When the president talks about hunting down those responsible and punishing those people or anyone who harbored those people, short of an admission of guilt or a claim of responsibility from Osama bin Laden or some other group, how are they going to put the pieces together to be sure that they're striking back in the right direction? Well, Matt, you know, it's said that uh, revenge is a dish best eaten cold. And I think that uh, while we are all tempted to want to lash out immediately, this is going to be the kind of thing that we have to get right. And part of the reason for that is the fact that uh, this is going to be, again, an effort that's going to entail the intelligence agencies, our diplomatic efforts, as well as our military. And it's terribly important that we get these targets right. It's terribly important that we not just do the kind of 
pinprick attacks that we've had in the past. This is all or nothing. Ken, talk about the coordination that was required to pull this off with two planes striking the World Trade Center within 20 minutes of one another and then 20 minutes later another at the Pentagon and a short time after that the fourth plane <clears throat> crashing in Pittsburgh. Matt, the, the coordination here I cannot say enough about simply because of the fact that in the military we talk about time over target, time one target. And what you had here, it was necessary for the terrorists to do that because once we copped to the idea that there were systematic attacks underway, we could take countermeasures. They did all this within the space of about half an hour, 45 minutes. And what they had to do was to be in communication. They had to have a good plan. They had to be well positioned. And they had to have excellent communications with each other to know that it was that the operation was all underway. The thing that's amazing, too, is the fact that they had to have some understanding of the weather. Uh, the weather both here in Washington as well as in New York uh, was absolutely perfect. Uh, it was the crystal clear kind of weather that you would want to have if you were planning an operation like this. The which, I'm sorry, Ken, the physical target, obviously, they brought down two towers of the World Trade Center, a section of the Pentagon, and, and it seems luckily no building was hit outside Pittsburgh. But talk for a second, if you will, about the emotional target that they managed to strike this day. Matt, everything that they did brought the war home to the United States. They struck deliberately at our financial center. They struck deliberately uh, at our transportation network. They struck deliberately at the military apparatus of the United States. And much more critically, what they took on was the power, the prestige, and the might of the United States. So among other things, this is going to require a response that is totally out of proportion to anything that we've seen in the counterterrorist war to this point. Ken Allard. Ken, thanks very much. Pleasure, Matt. Katie? Matt, as you well know, scores of New York hospitals and hospitals in the New York area have been mobilized to deal with the thousands of people who were injured and critically injured, some even killed in the blast. Bob Bazell spent most of the day at St. Vincent's Hospital here in Manhattan. Bob, what can you tell us? Do you have any clear numbers at this point in time, or is that still impossible to say? It's very difficult to say, Katie, but what's kind of frightening right now is that the numbers are fairly low, and low is a relative term in this context. But right now, we know of about a 1,000 casualties in all the New York area hospitals that have been taking them in. The one where I was, St. Vincent's Hospital, had is about 250. Uh, as you can see from that picture, some of them are horribly burned and mangled in other ways. In addition to the burn injuries, the hospitals have been receiving concussion injuries from people who are hit by falling stone and broken glass. But the numbers are low because probably most of the victims are still buried in the rubble. And in that... In and the rescuers can't get to it because of the intense flames that we've been seeing all day. In addition to that, the about one in five of the people who were brought in seriously injured or dead were either firefighters, policemen, or EMS workers. So an enormous number of the, of the people who were injured today were, were rescue workers because of this uh, timing between the crash into the, an explosion in the first World Trade Center tower and the second one. A lot of people were going in to put out that emergency and then the building the second building exploded and then there were the collapse so we were seeing a lot of heroic firefighters and police and uh, emergency service workers who were injured as well in addition to this uh, injury story Katie today has been a, a day of course like none other in New York all day long people were embracing each other on the street strangers crying people hysterically looking for their children uh, New York City schools kept the children all day long but uh, everybody wanted to know and where their children were. The, the subway stopped running. People had relatives inside those buildings. Of course, enormous numbers of people worked in the World Trade Center. There was one nurse at St. Vincent's Hospital where I was who was on an email with her husband who was in one, the, worst, the standing tower. Uh, he was assuring her he was okay. The email went blank. She looked out the window and the building collapsed. We're going to hear hundreds, probably thousands of stories like that in the, in the next few days as we get more and more information out of this. But uh, for a while today, Katie, as you also know, the New York City subway system was closed down. There was no way to get anywhere. People were just wandering around aimlessly and looking at the smoking hulks of what used to be one of the major landmarks of the city. Katie? In fact, Bob, some of that video of people sort of wandering around in a daze, sort of aimlessly, completely covered with soot and ash, almost looking ghost-like. Did you see many of those people kind of wandering or being helped to St. Vincent's? I did indeed, Katie, because St. Vincent's is the closest trauma center to uh, the World Trade Center, and it's where the biggest number of trauma victims went. And a lot of family members came there looking for their loved ones. Also, downtown Manhattan for people, or, or southern Manhattan for people who are familiar with the geography was just closed off 
nobody could go in there, but people could walk out. And, and it was like an enormous army of dazed people covered with ash who kept walking up the major thoroughfares, uh, going north, trying to find their way home or somewhere uh, away from the smoke, the dust, and the death that they had seen everywhere. I saw ambulance workers today, Katie, crying. Uh, these are people who have seen the most horrible things on earth that you could imagine, and yet they hadn't imagined that they would ever see anything like this today. Policemen were crying, firemen were crying. It was this, it was, I don't think anybody had ever imagined that New York City or any city in the United States would ever face a trauma, a crisis like the one we're seeing today. I know that Cardinal Egan was on hand from the New York Archdiocese offering his prayers, even delivering last rites to some of the victims who were brought to St. Vincent's. Yes, he was there and he, he was saying a religious, uh, he had religious uh, sentiments for people of all faiths who were brought in there. St. Vincent's happens to be a Catholic hospital, but it's not just for Catholics, of course. And the, the sense of, of death destruction uh, is enormous, but the most eerie thing about standing in the emergency room is that things went much slower than anticipated. There still are enormous numbers of people under that rubble, and it's going to be a long time. The people at the hospitals expect to be taking care of survivors for many days to come. How about staffing, Bob? Are they concerned about that, or are they uh, pretty hopeful that they'll have enough medical professionals on hand to deal with the people who continue to stream in there? Well, the New York City Emergency Services uh, systems had, an, had a plan for this that worked as well as, as far as we can tell, very well. They set up triage centers in two locations at least, maybe more, in, in the downtown region, and they sent people off to various hospitals so that no one hospital was swamped. And in fact, a large number of people were taken on the Staten Island Ferry across the Hudson River to hospitals both on Staten Island and even a much larger number to hospitals in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, uh, the hospitals have managed to be able to deal with the, the load that they've had and they're starting to get ready for the long haul. Everybody who was on the staff of every hospital showed up volunteering. At one point, uh, in St. Vincent's Hospital, which is in Greenwich Village, they put out a call for blood donors, and so many showed up, hundreds and hundreds of people within minutes showed up that they had to take them in buses to other hospitals well, where there was still a great need for blood. But uh, nobody thinks this story, uh, in terms of caring for the survivors, is anywhere near its end. All right, Bob Bazell. Bob, thank you so much for, for that report and for talking with us this afternoon. We appreciate it. Incidentally, two makeshift morgues have been set up here in Manhattan, one in the borough of Manhattan Community College, the second at Greenwich Street and uh, the corner of North Moor, and a third makeshift morgue may be set up a little bit later on. Matt? And as Bob may have mentioned, uh, New Yorkers have been lining up at some hospitals looking to donate blood for survivors who may be in need. Ashley Banfield has been down in the area near the World Trade Center reporting all day. She joins us now. Ashley? Hi, Matt. I can, I can, I'm having a tough time hearing you, but there are a number of emergency vehicles that are now coming out of the vicinity of number seven uh, World Trade Center that has just gone down. And I just wanted to let you know very quickly, before that, number six World Trade Center went down and housed in those two buildings, offices of OSHA, U.S. Customs, ATF, and a number of other retail spaces as well. Um, not only that, but financial offices too. Those buildings had all been cleared out after the first plane hit the World Trade Center this morning. So there was, there was some speculation that there's not a, a soul in those buildings at the time. Certainly, number seven that just went down as we were live on the air earlier on with MSNBC was cleared out. Most people, they said earlier that they were just waiting for that building to go down. So they were expecting this to happen. Not only that, it is still an awesome sight when this happens. I just wanted to introduce you very quickly to Mel and his son Max, who have basically evacuated their own uh, house. You live just down this way, just past this red building, is that right? Yeah, Duane Street, just by Chambers Street. You just picked up your animals and, and one overnight bag and gotten out of there. Were you told by anybody that uh, you needed to get out of there quickly? No, actually, we had a hard time getting back there because the whole area has been cut off. But we were, we'd already left, but we didn't have any of our stuff. So now we're trying to get back because the... Uh, water, the electricity has all been cut off, and, uh, you know, we basically have to move out of the area. Where are you going to spend the night? Friend's house. We, we have, you know, our, our children, our other children in Brooklyn, we can't even figure out how to get there. So. Max, you were in school, you were in high school, not far away. You could see the actual uh, plane crash and the fireball that ensued after that. Well, uh, I was in class and my friend uh, said, oh my God, someone bombed the World Trade Center, and we all said, that's not funny. And uh, we looked out the window and there was an explosion. Then we turned on the news and we saw 
on the TV of the smoke and the coverage. We saw another plane going out. I said, well, is this a replay of some sort? And we looked out the window and we saw the explosion carry through the other side of the building. And they just kept you in the school at that point? They kept us in the school and I think it was a smart idea because uh, if they kept us in the school, like that way kids wouldn't run down there and see what was happening. And then later they evacuated the school. Thanks very much and good luck to you. I hope you are all safe. Matt, I just wanted to tell you really quickly what happened earlier. We have been moved about five different times. Uh, my producer and I, early this morning, right after the first, uh, first World Trade Center came down, were caught in the debris of the uh, collapsing second World Trade Center. In fact, our clothes are still covered with all of this gray ash, and that's what you see when you see a lot of the people who are coming out of that epicenter. They're covered from head to toe in gray. Some of the emergency vehicles that have been coming through here as well, windows blown out. We saw an ambulance that was completely burned out on one side. The windows were blown out. The ambulance driver just told us as he was rolling by, this was a brand new ambulance this morning. Not only that, but we can tell you that we've been moved five times because there is the concern that more buildings will collapse. We are not being told now that any more buildings are in peril of collapse. Collapsing, but we have heard other buildings potentially uh, nearby are unstable. They are keeping us at this particular uh, perimeter uh, because there's not too much concern that the wind is going to blow northward. The wind has been blowing eastward off of the island of Manhattan and into uh, the other boroughs east in Brooklyn. Um, but at this point, we seem to be okay at this vantage point, and we are about, I'd say, about seven blocks from where Seven World Trade Center stood just within the half hour. All right, Ashley Banfield reporting from downtown. Ashley, thanks very much. Just a reminder that airports across the country are closed. There's a ground hold in effect until about noon, at least noon tomorrow. For a while, the borders between the U.S. and Canada and the U.S. and Mexico were closed. We're not sure whether those have been reopened. There was a high state of alert issued for nuclear power plants across the country. Obviously, some fear that if planes had been hijacked, that one might target a nuclear facility. Again, so much of life in America as we know it has been disrupted, and that, of course, is one of the targets of terrorism. That's right. We want to remind people also, once again, Matt, that President Bush will address the nation at some point tonight when we find out specifically when we will let you know. Meanwhile, there is a sports facility, a massive sports facility called Chelsea Piers here in Manhattan, which is about 20 blocks away from the World Trade Center, from the Twin Towers, which we've been watching first burn and then totally collapse all day today. Apparently, a triage unit has been set up at that facility. Soledad O'Brien is on the phone now. Soledad, what can you tell us is happening there? Well, Katie, you're absolutely right. The Chelsea Piers, which is, as you described it, a massive, sprawling athletic complex, has been set up as a triage facility. And it runs along, of course, the West Side Highway. Looking up the West Side Highway, looking down the West Side Highway, ambulances lined up one after the other. They are all on active standby because the doctors inside this triage unit, who are, as of yet are not treating any patients, have been told the fire is just burning too hot. They can't actually get in rescue people and then bring them here. They are, however, on active standby. We have seen easily 100 doctors in and out. They've come from area hospitals, and by area hospitals, I mean not only here in New York City, but also Connecticut, New Jersey. Uh, doctors have volunteered their time, nurses as well, EMTs. In addition, there's also a line for other volunteers who've come by and a line where they are taking uh, blood donations because, of course, as many have mentioned before me, they're looking and they need uh, desperately blood to be donated. So they are on active standby inside the Chelsea Piers on a basketball court in addition to some of the studios that are uh, working studios here at Chelsea Piers. They've set up hundreds of tables. These are going to be makeshift operating tables, and as soon as those ambulances come by, they're going to bring folks in who are survivors, uh, hopefully, and be able to work on them, although there are many doctors that we have talked to today who said that they also could expect, because of the size and the sprawl of this facility, it could as well be turned into a morgue. They are saying at this time, uh, no one can get in there, it's too hot, and they are just on standby for whatever horrific, and they tell me they are expecting a horrific scene as soon as they can get in there to rescue some of the folks inside. All right, Soledad O'Brien. Soledad, thank you very much. CNBC's Ron Insana has been uh, very close to this story throughout the day. He was actually close to the World Trade Center when one of the towers collapsed. And, and Ron, I know that was a close call for you personally, but I'm curious if you could just inform us a little more about the types of offices that are located at the World Trade Center and their importance to the financial markets in this country and around the world. Well, Matt, the, the World Trade Center is one of the nerve centers in lower Manhattan uh, uh, where there are not just financial firms, Morgan Stanley being the biggest uh, financial client or tenant in that building, uh, but there are exchanges that trade gold and silver. We have seen uh, 
other firms like Cantor Fitzgerald, which is not well known uh, among the general public, but is a, a very large uh, NASDAQ-style trading firm. Uh, so this is one of the financial nerve centers in lower Manhattan where uh, there is a great deal of activity every day. There are trading rooms. There is, as we said, an exchange. Uh, commodities are traded there. It's, it's an environment where now a couple things are going to be called into question. One, the viability of some of the client firms to make good on whatever outstanding transactions they had prior to today. Uh, to the extent that uh, financial activity is impaired, uh, permanently impaired at the World Trade Center that may have a feedback effect elsewhere. Uh, we should point out that the financial market response around the world today was dramatic. We saw stocks drop somewhere between 6 and 8 percent in Europe today. Gold prices spiked up rather dramatically in overseas markets. And then we also had oil go up more than $3 a barrel on the world oil markets as well. So the effects, not just to the financial markets themselves, but to the economy, are being uh, questioned and, and, and analyzed all around the world this evening, Matt. And, of course, we've heard that the markets here in this country were closed today. We've been told they'll be closed again tomorrow. I mean, exactly. Exactly. How long can we expect them to be shut down until they can get up and running again? Well, the, 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 there are so many sensitive issues to be dealt with, not the least of which will be security for the participants uh, in those marketplaces downtown, the New York Stock Exchange being the principal exchange in lower Manhattan. Uh, it is likely, one would assume, that uh, because of the worry that disrupting the financial markets could be worse uh, than, shutting, uh, than, than letting them open up and respond to the situation, that tomorrow may be the only day on which uh, the various exchanges are closed. That remains to be seen, and there will be a decision tomorrow as to whether or not the New York Stock Exchange will remain closed beyond Wednesday. Latin American markets, for instance, will decide tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Eastern time whether or not to open as scheduled. There will be regular trading in Tokyo tonight. Uh, so. Financial regulators, policymakers will be deciding over the next several hours whether to allow the markets to respond to this catastrophe and let them take their course. Uh, the biggest question right now is how this event is going to affect consumer psychology in this country and will this terrorist attack create a level of uncertainty and possibly even panic among consumers that they really curtail their spending, which could throw the U.S. economy into a, an official recession. That's the worry among economists this evening. All right, CNBC's Ron and Sana. Ron, thank you very much. Thank you, Katie? Skip Brandon is the former FBI counterterrorism chief. He joins us from Washington. Mr. Brandon, thank you for joining us. What will the FBI's role be in determining who was responsible for these attacks and also in protecting the United States from future attacks as well? Uh, they'll be the lead law enforcement agency in the effort, and they'll coordinate uh, all of the efforts of not only law enforcement, but of the intelligence uh, community in this. This will be probably the largest effort the FBI has ever undertaken. Um, you know, senior U.S. intelligence officials, or one senior U.S. intelligence official, uh, says now that the U.S. is 90 percent certain that bin Laden was responsible for mm -hmm. today's attack. Would you concur with that conclusion? I, I think that's a very good possibility. You have to look at who has the organization and who has the capability to do something like this. And, of course, uh, bin Laden's al-Qaeda organization uh, has to be right at the top of the list. I agree. And, well, tell us, I mean, it seems that people are drawing that conclusion because this seems to be him, his organization's M.O. in the past. Can you describe other attacks that he is believed to be responsible for and why this seems to follow suit? Uh, one of his people actually did the World Trade Center the first time it was bombed, uh, his, a group that was affiliated with him. Uh, and, I, and the, the embassy bombings that have happened most recently are the ones that come to mind immediately. One thing that's interesting is that one of the people that, uh, that did train with him, who was involved in the World Trade Center, uh, had been almost caught in the Philippines during an explosion. The investigators after this explosion found uh, evidence in his apartment which indicated uh, large-scale attacks and the use of American uh, airplanes blowing them out of the air, a variation on what happened today. All right, Skip Brandon, former FBI counterterrorism chief. Again, Mr. Brandon, thanks so much. Katie, all day long we've been hearing horrifying stories from people who, eyewitness, who were eyewitnesses to at least one portion of this attack. Harry Crosby is a managing director at Merrill Lynch, uh, a company that has its offices in lower Manhattan. Harry, good morning, good afternoon, excuse me. It's been a long day. Hi, Matt, how are you? Tell me, I, I'm fine, thank you. Tell me, I know you, you got fairly close to the World Trade Center towers at the point before they were collapsing. And, and, you, you explained something and described something to me on the phone before that, that stopped my heart, and that was the, the images you saw of people scrambling to, to escape the flames 
on one of those towers and then some of those people actually jumping off those towers. Yes, I think the thing that was most harrowing, uh, uh, we tend to ignore common sense. I was about uh, three blocks away. Um, the first building had already been hit. Uh, the second building had just been hit. Um, and uh, the impact of the second building, of the plane coming from the second building came from the south. So to me, uh, from where I stood, it looked like a, a massive explosion. Um, I continued to see people actually go in both directions, uh, oddly enough. I think people were evacuating all buildings. Um, I was actually at that time trying to get to work uh, and, uh, and basically stood and watched, uh, a bit like a deer in the headlights, uh, the people evacuating. Uh, the fire was tremendous uh, in the first building, uh, the northmost tower. And, uh, and people could not escape, uh, I think, the heat. They continued to go up, it appears. And there were an enormous number of people that, uh, that jumped uh, from the building. So you're talking about people jumping from above probably the 80th or 90th floor. And we've had reports that some people were actually leaving windows and the building holding hands. Uh, they were jumping in pairs. Uh, they were jumping. Uh, it, it, was, it was raining people. Uh, it was amazing to see, and, and uh, while you think uh, you should turn away and, and escape, I think everybody was um, uh, just frozen uh, and, and watching. Uh, there was a lot of crying. I think that a lot of people were extremely disturbed, uh, but very few people left the scene. Uh, the other thing that was uh, uh, quite disturbing, I think no one, including myself, questioned the integrity and the strength of both the buildings uh, that collapsed. Um, uh, most of the uh, the police were there. Uh, they responded quickly and tried to make way for EMS and paramedics and others to uh, to get close to the building. Um, and uh, and I think a lot of people were in fact trapped when the first building collapsed. I had then uh, moved north towards uh, the Travelers Building, 388 right. Greenwich, and uh, and at that point um, it was uh, it was uh, it was spooky and just escaped just escaped the first uh, the first collapse. All right. Harry Crosby. Harry, thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. I know that uh, we're going to be hearing many harrowing stories along those lines. I know Harry said to us there were about 100 or 150 people who jumped to their deaths from the high floors of the World Trade Center. Again, it's been quite a day. We started by watching just before 9 o'clock a gaping hole that we thought was some kind of plane accident that had crashed into the World Trade Center. And we watched and saw live a second plane crash into the second Twin Tower. Later, we heard about the Pentagon. And then, of course, that fourth terrible crash outside Pittsburgh. Some stations will be staying with us. Some will be returning to local news. We will have blanket coverage on this NBC station either way. For those of you who are staying with us, now here. This is a News 10 NBC special report. America under siege. Good evening. I'm Janet Lomax. I'm Gabe Dalmoth. We interrupt NBC special coverage of this horrible disaster to bring you the latest information locally. Of course, a day none of us uh, will ever forget. Thousands of people are injured or killed after apparent terrorist attacks in New York City, Washington, D.C., and in Pennsylvania. We go to our newsroom where Brian Martin is standing by live. Yeah, Janet and Gabe, we continue to follow local developments here in the newsroom. We're also, of course, watching the several monitors and televisions that we have here in the newsroom as well as the AP Wire. A reminder, we will not hesitate to return you to national coverage if there is any breaking news. Now, many Rochesterians actually witnessed this blast in New York City. We spoke to a local mother who was trying to reach her 31-year-old son on his cell phone. Joyce Perry finally reached Britton Perry after he ran from flying debris as the World Trade Center collapsed. Britain explained the situation. It was horrible. You saw bodies falling out of the windows. People were jumping out from, it must have been, at, what, 50, 60 stories up, people were falling out. And you just sat there and, and you watched it. And then when that building came down, people just ran. I mean, there was just no, no room. People, it was just mass hysteria. Now, Perry told us that he normally walks through the Trade Center to get to his office just right next door. Today, however, he took a different route. Needless to say, he's thankful to be alive. Reporting live from the newsroom, Brian Martin, News 10 NBC.
And obviously a terrifying situation for those on board planes in the air at the time the events were unfolding. Wendy Wright continues our live coverage from Rochester's International Airport. Wendy. Well, Janet, Rochester International Airport is completely shut down right now, and all non-essential personnel has been sent home. The FAA says there will be no commercial air service anywhere in the U.S. until at least noon tomorrow. Two planes that were in the air when the terror began were diverted here to Rochester. Passengers on board, those those planes were bused to their destinations in Boston and Hartford. Those people on board the planes not involved in the hijackings or crashes say they are simply happy to be on the ground tonight. Many were confused, some in tears, but all thankful their planes were not hijacked. In fact, one woman I spoke with says she was on a plane on the tarmac next to the one that crashed into the World Trade Center. Elaine Whitfield Sharp remembers the faces of those people who boarded. But I knew something was wrong when we were flying in the wrong direction. You could see all this black smoke over Manhattan. It was just engulfed in black smoke. And county officials say that any passengers who do have scheduled departing flights here tomorrow should call the airlines directly to check on their flight information. Again, no planes will be flying in and out of Rochester or anywhere in the United States before noon tomorrow. Reporting live from Rochester International Airport, Wendy Wright, News 10 NBC. Our Wendy, much of downtown Rochester shut down today as a precaution. Several buildings were evacuated. Workers left the Monroe County office building mid-morning when the county entered a state of emergency. The evacuations took place all over the city at places like the county courthouse and the public safety building. Workers also cleared out of the federal building. Guards stood outside making sure that people stayed away. My reaction is you would never think that this would happen in this in the U.S. I mean, this is like we have combat right now in the backyard at this point. I mean, it's, it's very sad to hear. I don't know. It's just, it's kind of scary. And, you know, so, I mean, it's just scary, so. I just want to go home, so. It's scary. This is scary. It's like, I'm, I'm just, like, shaking right about now. I, I can't believe it. I heard it on the way to work. And then it's, it's like more, more and more things are just happening, one after another. None of the buildings evacuated here in Rochester was, in fact, threatened in any way. This was just a precaution. Area religious leaders are reacting to the day's events, and many local churches, synagogues, and mosques are also on high alert. Deborah Boxty joins us live from the Islamic Center of Rochester. Deborah. Well, Janet, we are told that this is one of many religious facilities around the area on heightened alert. If you look over here, you can see members of the Brighton Police Department over there. They are at the Islamic Center. Janet, we're going back to you. All right, Deborah, we're sorry to interrupt you, but we have breaking news out of uh, New York City. We're going to go back to NBC coverage right now. It is the seat of power in the nation of Afghanistan, and you see there in the distance a line of flames. What we're lacking here is context, connection between what happened today, the events that may change life in the United States of America, and what is happening half a world away tonight in the dark, in the skies, and on the ground in Kabul, Afghanistan. But these are live pictures coming in via CNN uh, on a video phone. Let's begin our coverage with this in mind with NBC News Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent Andrea Mitchell in Washington. Andrea, what are we watching? What's its connection? Difficult to know what we're watching, but it would be if, there, if they are missile attacks, it would most likely be American retaliation against Kabul because we had warned the Taliban leaders of Afghanistan that if there were any evidence indicating that Osama bin Laden, whom they've been harboring for many years, was responsible for today's attacks or for any other attacks, that we would retaliate. This warning has been communicated to the Taliban leaders uh, directly and indirectly over the course of many weeks. They denied today any involvement by bin Laden, but we have been told by top officials in the United States government that they are 90 percent sure that bin Laden was responsible. I don't think we would have been told that if they didn't have enough evidence to retaliate. So what you may be watching, and I should stress, Brian, that we don't know the source of this video, 
But what you may be watching is tracer attacks, uh, signs of missile attacks on Kabul, and it, if that is the case, it could well be a U.S. retaliation for what happened today. Andrea, the missiles were earlier visible in midair, and the trails behind them were consistent with uh, what we've seen to be uh, cruise missile attacks in the past. Now we see the, the flames flaring up in the center of the lands. Uh, we're going to pause just a minute. We'll dip into the audio of their coverage. We'll come back and talk further about what is underway tonight. First, we're seeing the flash, and then we hear the detonation some several seconds afterwards, and they appear to be coming from that airport area, in some cases uh, several miles away from us. There is still uh, a lot of flashing uh, we can see in the air reflected off clouds that could be thunder and lightning. However, there's a possibility that those reflections and missiles landing elsewhere, uh, the flashes as they explode and reflecting off the clouds. But it's not a good indication. We certainly don't hear uh, any detonations coming from that particular direction at this time. Um, the anti-aircraft fire that we were seeing a little while ago is not uh, coming up from the city. The city, uh, apart from the detonations we were hearing a few minutes ago, appears very, very calm. The visibility here is excellent. We can see all the way across the city. It lies on a plain that's surrounded by the mountains here in Kabul. We have high mountains to the right. These mountains were used by the Mujahideen as vantage points for shelling the city uh, several years ago during the Mujahideen infighting in Kabul. The last five years, the Taliban have been in control of this city, have been trying to extend their control over and across Afghanistan and the foreign minister this evening uh, telling journalists and CNN that he didn't believe that the Afghanistan would be attacked. He said if Afghanistan was attacked, then they would call it, the Taliban would call it an act of state-sponsored terrorism, Joey. All right, that is CNN's Nick Robertson. Again, please keep the line open to us, Nick Robertson. There Andrea Mitchell uh, back in the Washington Bureau on this so day when, say? if nothing else, we have learned to expect anything and not to trust anything. We've okay. had false reports okay. of a car bomb at the U.S. State Department and a plane landing at, at Camp David. Uh, if, Andrea, this was indeed an American uh, cruise missile attack retaliation, uh, what footprints would the attack on the U.S. have to have left behind? We've apparently lost touch with Andrea Mitchell in Washington. John Palmer is at the Pentagon for us tonight. John, perhaps you can uh, handle that question. Uh, and the question is, what footprints would the attack on the U.S. have to have left behind for retaliation to come so swiftly, it being just past 6 p.m. here in the East now? Brian, they would have to have certainly hard evidence uh, to trace this back to bin Laden to uh, carry out this particular attack. It's been unusual today because officials have been rather outspoken, pointing fingers. And as uh, Andrea Mitchell reported a short time ago, that's a little bit unusual this early. Just a short time ago, a number of reporters were picked up. We're about a half a mile from the Pentagon, as you can see behind me, that huge, horrible, gaping hole in the west side of the Pentagon where the hijacked American airliner crashed about 9.30 this morning. The officials from the Pentagon came over and picked up a group of reporters to take them over for a briefing. And I'm sure the uppermost question on everybody's mind is going to be, what about this retaliation? Is it underway? And, uh, and what's going on? And how is this particular uh, uh, tragedy traced directly to them? Now, John, uh, as we look at the damage, uh, uh, retrace a little bit the, the events of this day. The attack had just taken place in New York. Uh, the government as a whole was reacting to that. Uh, suddenly, and this was close to a, a landing pad there at the building, one of the five sides, as you just pointed out, having collapsed, suddenly all those at work and the death toll hovering around at 100 felt the concussion. Yes, uh, let's go back to about 9.30. Most of the people in this building were glued to television stations and television sets watching the, what was unfolding with the World Trade Center in New York City. And then shortly after 9.30, there was a huge blast. There were shouts in the hallways. A little bit later, smoke then filled the hallways. Uh, people dashed out. An alarm went off at the Pentagon for people to leave. We are told that uh, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld himself left his office, which is on the far side 
side of the Pentagon, ran around to this gaping hole, this, uh, this side of the Pentagon on the west side, and uh, personally tried to help some of the people to, to, to get them out there. This occurred about 9.30 this morning, and hundreds of firemen have been battling the blaze now for more than eight hours. They have it well contained, but many areas have not been searched for casualties simply because of the flames and smoke. John Palmer at the Pentagon, thanks. We're going to go back across town to our Washington bureau, Andrea Mitchell. We had, uh, we had missile trails in the sky over Kabul, Afghanistan. What have you learned about this, Andrea? According to senior officials, they do not believe this is an American attack. This is not from the Pentagon. Let me be clear on my sourcing. It is from another intelligence agency. But they do not believe that this is a an, an U.S. attack. They think uh, possibly this is dissidents in Kabul, but be very careful. Uh, we have no confirmation at this point that the U.S. is retaliating against Afghanistan. All right. So uh, tonight, on this day that has seen an unprecedented attack on the uh, continental United States, missiles in the air over Afghanistan. Uh, it would seem to most pros that it would be awfully early for any kind of retaliation. And indeed, uh, Andrea Mitchell's source is telling her uh, that would be correct, that this is not uh, U.S. sponsored in any way, that it may be some other elements. But that is the picture tonight in Kabul, Afghanistan, again on what has been a uh, horrendous day in the United States, a day that may change the U.S. way of life. Lower Manhattan has been the epicenter of all of this beginning this morning. Most recently, it was the scene of yet another building collapse, one of the victims of today's earlier attack, really, by two hijacked aircraft full of passengers, and it is alleged hijacked pilots at the controls instead of the commercial jet pilots. Our own Ashley Banfield is in Lower Manhattan, where number seven World Trade Center was the latest building to collapse late this afternoon. Ashley? It's about 45 minutes ago. It went down right behind us. Just a thunderous cloud of dust again passing through the streets of Manhattan. Brian, it's happened four to five times already today. It was standing right behind us, as I said, at about 5.30 Eastern time. We had been warned. They were just waiting for this one to come down. The windows had already blown out. It had been an inferno for hours. We'd been cleared five different times northward from, the, uh, from ground zero, where the first and second World Trade Centers came down just after about 10 or 11 this morning. And every time we moved, there was this concern there'd be other buildings that went down. It was rather strange, but I was doing an interview with a, a woman and a small baby who were evacuating their apartment not far from this area when number seven came down. Here's a look at the tape. You can see what happened. Please be careful of your baby. Oh my God. Look behind us. Please pan in this way. Please be careful of your baby. This is it. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. No. No. We're, listen. We'll be all right. We'll be all right. We're okay. Ashley. I think we're okay. Ashley, I think we're okay. All right. We're going to have to move this way. We're going to have to move. We're going to have to move. That cloud is coming this way. The concern is that the cloud was uh, potentially going to be moving this way. The wind kept it eastward from us. We could maintain our position here on the perimeter. I just want to show you, Brian, from here down on the ground level in Manhattan, what some of the things that have been collected from the street can show us. I don't know if you can zoom into here, Michael, but uh, these papers were collected from one and two World Trade Center. The headers on them say those addresses here, the 81st floor deliveries, the 87th floor deliveries, the 90th floor, the 92nd floor, what kind of parcels have come in. They were found scattered within a mile. Also this I just wanted to show you as well. These are what were being cut as tourniquets for a lot of the, uh, the triage stations that were set up in the uh, treatment areas. I can also tell you that a police officer who had been down in that dust zone for the better part of the entire day told me that a, a morgue had been set up, the location of which wasn't being disclosed, but that most of the bodies, take a look at this if you can, as this, as this vehicle goes through. That's evidence of what we've seen a lot of today. Police and emergency vehicles covered in the Mount St. Helens type dust and also the windows blown out. An ambulance also burned all along one side. The windows blown out of it as well. The ambulance driver passing through here and telling me this ambulance was new this morning. It's really just an unbelievable scene, Brian. All right, Ashley Banfield in Lower Manhattan. It was an unbelievable day for the traveling White House. We may never know the threat assessment as seen against this president today. This day saw him start out in Florida 
Florida then moved to two different Air Force bases, one in Louisiana, one in the Midwest, before being en route back to Washington tonight, where we have learned he will address the nation on television. Because the White House was evacuated, the Vice President and First Lady were taken to safe places. NBC News correspondent Bob Kerr is doing his work out of FBI headquarters that has become the de facto White House briefing room this evening. Bob, good evening to you. Brian, good evening. Uh, on the phone this time because we have moved. A small group of us now are the first to be let in back to the White House. I have just uh, cleared security, and uh, you know the walk. I'm walking down the uh, through the northwest gate into the driveway, looking straight at the west wing as we speak. So a small group of press now being allowed back in here to the White House. What's odd, Brian, is that tonight, a little while from now, there was supposed to be a joyous and gala barbecue on the south lawn, a barbecue for uh, Congress uh, put on by President Bush. Obviously, that is not going to happen. Uh, the president himself was out of town today and kept out of town for a good while. Uh, first in Nebraska, or rather first to a Louisiana Air Force uh, facility, and then to a Nebraska Air Force base from where he will uh, come back here to the White House. Uh, also, for that matter, the congressional leaders, we're told, were also spirited out of town to uh, protect them. Um, I can tell you, Brian, we made a uh, seven-block walk from um, the FBI building on 10th Street up here to the White House on 17th. It was and rema it remains a ghost town in Washington. You could look down one of the major streets and see nothing but traffic lights and white lines. No cars. In one case, we saw a big fuel tanker truck escorted by two police cars moving quickly down one of the main streets. Uh, as you know, President Bush today has uh, spoken about this uh, uh, attack on the United States twice, calling it a national tragedy, calling the incidents cowardly acts and uh, terrorism against the United States, which he says will not stand. Here's a bit of what President Bush had to say in a statement this afternoon. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward. Earth. And freedom will be defended. Earth. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims of these attacks. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. Brian, back here at the White House now, again, a small group of us being allowed in, uh, awaiting, we think, what will be a statement from President Bush after he arrives here. Uh, a parting uh, thought for you. One of the sights that was um, utterly unreal here today was in the skies above the White House and the National Mall in Washington on at least three or four occasions uh, one could look up and see fighter jets crisscrossing in the sky. Uh, there were obviously no commercial planes around. All that had been shut down. Instead, there were uh, flights, overflights by, uh, by jet fighters uh, in and around the area of the White House and the Mall. Bob Kerr back inside the White House after a day outside the White House. And for those just joining us, that is indeed Lower Manhattan you were looking at earlier. What's different about the skyline? The World Trade Center, the landmark Twin Towers, both gone. The death toll is staggering. So many people from all walks of life, and it is destined to grow throughout the evening and throughout the days ahead. Among those who died is Barbara Olson. She had a long career in public service, was a television commentator, and the wife of the U.S. Solicitor General Ted Olson. Barbara Olson, a frequent contributor on NBC News broadcast, was 45. She was on board the plane that crashed at the Pentagon today. For more on the four different commercial aircraft that were hijacked, we go to NBC News correspondent Jim Cummins at American Airlines headquarters in Fort Worth, Texas tonight. Jim, good evening. Good evening, Brian. That's right. It was outrageous and audacious. Hijacking four commercial airliners, two 757s, Boeing 757s, two Boeing 767s, 
fully loaded with fuel and using them as weapons. They were loaded with fuel for cross-country flights and then using them as weapons against the U.S. First, there was American Flight 11, which was scheduled to go from Boston to Los Angeles this morning. 81 passengers aboard, nine flight attendants, two pilots. It was then diverted to New York, where it, uh, it hit the South Tower, plowed into the South Tower of the World Trade Center at 8.50 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Next, United Flight 175, also bound from Boston to L.A., 56 passengers aboard, two pilots, seven flight attendants on that plane. It plowed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center at approximately 9.08 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And then American Flight 77, bound from Washington Dulles to L.A., 58 passengers aboard, four flight attendants, two pilots. It plows into the Pentagon at approximately 9.30 this morning, just outside Washington. And finally, United Flight 93, it was going from Newark to San Francisco, 38 passengers aboard, five flight attendants, two pilots. It crashes into western Pennsylvania at approximately 10 o'clock this morning. Immediately, the government shut down all commercial air traffic until at least noon tomorrow. It disrupted trains, Greyhound buses, uh, commercial boat traffic, the borders were closed. And so it is just, it is shut down transportation in this country virtually, Brian, uh, until at least uh, sometime tomorrow morning and for the air traffic system until noon tomorrow at the earliest is what they're telling us here at American Airlines. Jim Cummins out in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Thank you for that, Jim. And joining us now from Los Angeles, former U.S. Secretary of State Warren Christopher, who served, of course, in the first Clinton administration. Mr. Secretary, good evening to you. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Brian. Do you regard what happened today, as some have called it, during the day, an act of war? Yes, I think it is that, uh, Brian. You know, a, a mind searches for analogy in this situation, and I've lived long enough to remember Pearl Harbor. It's an event of that dimension. Uh, this day like that one will live long in infamy, as uh, President Roosevelt said. Mr. Secretary, what then should happen? What should the threshold be in the process of finding out who's responsible, who did this? Well, I think we have to be calm and focused, bring clarity to the situation. We have to make a very, very thorough investigation of the situation. And, Brian, it's important not to get just to the immediate perpetrators, but to get to those who supported it. This event required uh, coordination, integration, a great deal of financial support, a great deal of planning. It wasn't done by one or two people. It wasn't done in a back room. So we not only need to find out who did it in the United States, but what their supporters were abroad. One thing I would caution against is jumping to conclusions. As you may remember, in the Oklahoma City bombing, everybody thought for several days that it had been an, uh, come from abroad, and perhaps we should take a lesson from that and work through this very systematically. But when we find out, then we're going to have to act great, great precision and, and great definiteness. Is there any evidence uh, that it is uh, that is foreign terrorism per se and not domestic terrorism, given the clockwork-like timing of it all? Uh, we don't have any evidence of that right now at all. Now, evidently, probably our intelligence agencies have some beginning evidence on the subject, but. One would have to say, just without pointing any figures, that there has been a massive intelligence failure, a massive security failure. For this to have happened at four airports in the United States, three, possibly four airports, and for it to have happened with all this planning means that we really were lax, much as we were in the days before Pearl Harbor. The president has been handed, of course, a national tragedy, the likes of which the uh, president hasn't had since about uh, FDR, by my reckoning. If you were counseling him tonight, uh, what points does he need to touch on for an anxious American viewing public? Well, I think you have to emphasize the importance of being unified, and we will be unified behind him. He has to emphasize the importance of getting to the bottom of this and, as I said earlier, not just getting the immediate perpetrators, but finding out where the support came from, where the financing came from. And I think he also has to find a prescription for the future so Americans will once again feel safe. People are not going to ride on airplanes for some time without the feeling a great deal of insecurity or go into big buildings. Now, America can't live like that for long. We will come back from this just as we have from other tragedies, but it's going to take a great deal of presidential and national leadership to once again make us feel safe and secure. I doubt that uh, this day will uh, ever be forgotten. I think we've reached a defining moment 
things will be different in the future. Uh, when you say things will be different, and beyond the fact that uh, flying domestically and overseas might take longer, what, what form will it take, do you think? I think there will have to be a good deal of more security surveillance around the country. We'll have to step up our intelligence. Uh, we'll have to find additional ways. And also, Brian, we need to recognize that this is an international problem. The terrorists uh, plan in one country, do their dastardly acts in another country, and flee to a third country. So we need to have a coordinated international response. We can't do it alone, but the United States has to take the lead. You're a veteran attorney. What, uh, what about when uh, that increased surveillance, increased security, runs up against the Bill of Rights? Well, we've been able to solve those problems in the past. Uh, Brian, I think there will be an awful lot of cooperation from uh, the American people and the courts in recognizing that this is a dire American emergency and one that we'll, uh, we'll have to do it within the context of our Constitution, but I'm confident that we can. I want you to, I want to get you on record on the uh, uniquely American ability to put party labels aside and fall in line behind the chief executive during times of great national strain. Well, we've done it over and over again, and clearly we will do it this time as we have so often in the past, as we did uh, in 1941 after Pearl Harbor, as we did indeed uh, after the uh, riots in 1967 and 68, we recognize that we're in a situation where we're going to have to act together. We're going to have to act to be unified and put partisan bickering to one side uh, as rapidly as we can. Is there anything worse about this vis-a-vis -vis Pearl Harbor in that we still don't know who the enemy is? Yes, that's certainly right. Uh, there you, had a, you could focus on a particular enemy, find ways to combat this, but uh, them, but under the present circumstances, we're going to have to take some time and find out who did it and how to react. Uh, well, Mr. Secretary, uh, after what's been a, a, a very uh, a tough day in this country, when you uh, look back at the events of the last couple of hours, uh, you look at uh, what had been passing for domestic political issues, in addition to this changing day-to-day -day life in the country, do you think this will change the access of the entire argument? Do you think this will increase now interest in things like your stock and trade foreign affairs? Uh, there's no doubt that it will. I think we're going to have to understand where this came from. We're going to have to understand who our enemies are around the world, and we have to understand who our friends are. I would hope and expect that all the civilized world will join us in combating this, not just our NATO allies, but China and Russia as well. We need to get together in the civilized world to combat this. And in, on Capitol Hill, I think there will be a whole new set of issues I don't expect to hear much talk about uh, what happened to the surplus in the, in the coming days. Do we get too lax? Uh, do we get too carried away with the end of the Cold War? Uh, yes, I think that there was some laxity, much as there was before Pearl Harbor. We perhaps were too confident about uh, we are a long ways away from the terror of the Middle East. I'm not saying this came from there, but it bears many of the earmarks of that. Uh, four suicide bombers or groups of suicide bombers because those planes probably weren't taken over by a single person. You can just imagine what went on on board those planes. So it bears some marks of a society, a, a group of people that we simply don't understand and can't comprehend. But that doesn't mean we can't take full action in, in meeting it, even though we may not be able to comprehend it tonight as we sit in our stunned uh, uh, concern for the people in New York and Washington, D.C. Former Secretary of State Warren Christopher, as always, sir, sir, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Brian. For those of you watching us on the NBC Television Network, stay tuned for a special 90-minute edition of NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. For those of you with us on MSNBC on cable, stay with us for uninterrupted coverage of this attack. I'm Brian Williams, NBC News. <laughs> Attack on America, a special edition of NBC Nightly News. Terrorists declare war on the United States, hijacking jetliners, crashing them into New York's World Trade Towers. Another airliner into the Pentagon, threatening the seat of national power. Thousands likely dead, downtown New York in chaos. America wondering, what next? 
Welcome on Midtown Manhattan, and tonight America is at war with terrorists after a stunning series of attacks today against targets in New York and in Washington, D.C., the World Trade Center, and the Pentagon. The terrorists use hijacked civilian airliners and their passengers as guided missiles in their attack, the most serious attack on this country since Pearl Harbor, and tonight the dead still are being counted. An unknown number still are missing. At this hour in this war, another development. There are reports out of Kabul tonight, the capital of Afghanistan, of explosions. But the Pentagon and the CIA are flatly denying that the United States had anything to do with those explosions. This has been one of the darkest days in America, and it is not yet over. Here at home now, a quick look at the locations where the four airliners hit. The Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in Lower Manhattan, 20 minutes apart. Then, within an hour this morning, the Pentagon. And then, the final crash just minutes later, about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh, 266 people on the four airplanes alone, all presumed to be dead. At the World Trade Center, even nine, more than nine hours now after this disaster began, officials do not know how many people were killed, how many still are trapped in all the rubble. We do know that on most days there would be at least 20,000 people at work in the World Trade Center at the time that the airliners crashed into those twin towers. Another 90,000 could be expected in the vicinity of those towers in the course of an average workday. And of course, scores of police, firefighters, and other emergency personnel were in the area when the buildings came down. We're going to get the view now from the White House and our correspondent there, Campbell Brown, also from the Pentagon and from Jim Mikloshevsky. And I'm going to jo join now with a complete account of what this day has been like from NBC's David Bloom, who's been my colleague all day long. David, bring us up to date. Well, Tom, more than nine and a half hours since the first attack, the smoke billowing from the hulks behind me is now more gray than black indicating that the fires have diminished somewhat, but it's still an extremely dangerous situation. Just within the last hour or so, a third building, a 40-story building, also collapsed. 40 more stories of concrete, steel, and iron crashed into the ground. A makeshift morgue has been set up near the World Trade Center. New York City police still stacking to their early estimates that the casualties ultimately may number in the thousands. Nothing more precise than that. We've put together a chronology of the events as America's watched dumbfounded and, yes, outraged and defiant. The first attack plane, a hijacked American Airlines flight out of Boston, slams into the North Tower of New York's World Trade Center at approximately 8.42 a.m. Eastern Time. The explosions and fireballs broadcast live by television helicopters, which then horrifically spot the second attack plane, a United Airlines flight hijacked from Boston, taking dead aim at the World Trade Center's South Tower. It's now approximately 9.03 a.m. Where the hell can I meet you? Oh, I'm across the street from the Marriott, man. A second airplane, a 727, just ran into the building. Emergency officials estimate 20,000 or more people may have been inside the two 110-story buildings at the time of the attacks. Eyewitnesses report victims falling, and in some cases, jumping from the two buildings. But there were people falling out of the sky. At 9.29 a.m., President Bush in Florida addresses the nation for the first time. Terrorism against our nation will not stand. But in the nation's capital, just 11 minutes later, 9.40 a.m., a third hijacked plane, an American flight out of Washington, Dulles, crashes into the Pentagon in a burst of flames, the plane's wreckage tearing a gaping hole into one side of the building. Federal buildings are evacuated, government leaders taken to secure hideouts. 9.59 a.m., the until now unthinkable, the south tower of the World Trade Center collapses. An unknown number of people still trapped inside, including the rescuers, firefighters and police who'd gone in trying to save lives. Then at 10 a.m., hundreds of miles away in western Pennsylvania, a fourth hijacked plane, a United flight out of Newark, crashes 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. One half hour later, 10.28 a.m., the north tower of the World Trade Center collapses. Rubble, debris spreading for blocks. In all, 266 people aboard four hijacked planes are killed. 
untold others in Washington and New York missing and presumed dead. In New York, a defiance, Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. The city of New York and the United States of America is much stronger than any group of barbaric terrorists. For the first time in U.S. history, the Federal Aviation Administration closes all domestic airports, shutting down all U.S. airspace until at least noon tomorrow. The U.S. military and American embassies worldwide placed on the highest alert. Navy aircraft carriers and destroyers deployed along the eastern seaboard. The president, now in Louisiana, speaks for a second time. The resolve of our great nation is being tested. But make no mistake, we will show the world that we will pass this test. The president is then taken to the secure Strategic Air Command in Nebraska, meets with his national security team via teleconference before boarding Air Force One to return to Washington. But in New York late this afternoon, a third damaged building, the 40-story World Trade Center number no. 7, also crashes to the ground. And emergency officials allow the first camera crew from NBC News inside the smoking hulks of the Twin Towers. Ground zero, cars overturned, steel torn apart, glass shards, small fires still burning. The very picture America most feared, the image terrorist most wanted. As to who might be responsible, a senior American intelligence official tells NBC News tonight that they are now, and I'm quoting here, 90 percent certain that Osama bin Laden, the Saudi board and terrorist, was responsible for today's attack. This official tells NBC News, quote, this is not just surmise, this is new information. The president plans to address the nation from Washington, D.C. tonight. Tom. Thank you very much, NBC's David Bloom. And we're going to go now to Washington where NBC's Campbell Brown, who covers the White House, is on duty, but across the street from the White House, the president is expected back there shortly. Campbell? Tom, the president is on his way back to Washington tonight. We're told that Air Force One is being escorted by F-15 fighter jets on each wing. As David said, he is planning to address the nation tonight. One aide says his message will be one of resolve and reassurance. And Tom, we are reporting to you tonight a block from the White House at a hotel. That's because those of us in the White House press corps, along with White House staff, were rushed out of the White House this morning as the entire complex was evacuated. Needless to say this has been an extraordinary day for the president. One aide says when he spoke with his national security team in a live teleconference today, he said, quote, we will find these people and they will suffer the consequences. Steel. Yes, steel. The president at a Sarasota, Florida elementary school about to begin a reading event gets first word shortly after 9 a.m. in a phone call from his national security advisor. One plane is crashed into the World Trade Center. Minutes later, Chief of Staff Andrew Card leans over and whispers in the president's ear. The reaction on Bush's face, the first sign of more horrifying news. A second plane has now hit the World Trade Center with all indications this is a terrorist attack. Uh, today we've had a national tragedy. As Bush speaks, chaos at the White House. Staff and press are ordered to evacuate. People run from their offices across Pennsylvania Avenue. Crowds pour into the streets as buildings nearby are evacuated. People gather around car radios for any information. Fire engines blaze toward the White House. Shortly after 9.30 a.m., the president's national security team is in the Situation Room, a secure communications center in the basement of the West Wing. Vice President Dick Cheney is there, along with National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice. Meanwhile, the president leaves Florida, his destination at takeoff a secret. We later learn he's landed at Louisiana's Barksdale Air Force Base. There, he These pledges, attacks. the U.S. will retaliate. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. The president then flies to the Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska, the U.S. Strategic Air Command Center. We're in a bunker there. He convenes a national security meeting, joining his team live by teleconference. Back in Washington, his top advisor, Karen Hughes, insists the White House has the situation under I'm control. Your federal government continues to function effectively. We have a federal emergency response plan, and at President Bush's direction, we are implementing it. 
By telephone, the president calls New York Mayor Giuliani and New York Governor Pataki. He also speaks with First Lady Laura Bush. The First Lady and Bush's two daughters are also rushed to secure secret locations. Mrs. Bush, on Capitol Hill when the attacks began, tries to offer words of reassurance. Well, parents need to reassure their children everywhere in our country that they're safe. We have just learned that Air Force One has safely landed at Andrews Air Force Base just outside of Washington. From our vantage point, we can see sharpshooters on the roof of the White House tonight, Secret Service patrolling the grounds, police cars driving up and down Pennsylvania Avenue, the White House in a lockdown as we wait to hear what the president has to say to the nation. Tom. Thanks very much, NBC's Campbell Brown. And there are so many questions, but a major question tonight. How could they hijack four civilian jetliners in such a precise fashion? How do they pull all that off? Our aviation expert is NBC's Robert Hager, and he's standing by now in Washington as well. Robert? Tom, four airliners turned into deadly weapons. There's a nationwide hold now on all commercial flights. That's the first time that's ever happened in our nation's history. And it lasts at least until midday tomorrow and might last longer than that. And there are also some chilling first details of what may have been going on in those cockpits. But first, the facts. The string of events that results in these four horrific crashes begins at Boston's Logan Airport, 7.45 a.m. American Flight 11, 767, with 92 on board. Supposed to fly Boston to Los Angeles, but over New York State, it's diverted, forced to fly south, directly into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. A long day of carnage is underway. Back in Boston, United Flight 175, another 767, with 65 aboard, is already in the air, also bound for Los Angeles, 15 minutes behind the first flight, when it too is hijacked. This, the actual plane, as it hits the south tower of the World Trade Center. 8.10 a.m., American Flight 77, a 757 with 64 aboard, has taken off from Washington's Dulles Airport, also bound for Los Angeles. It, too, taken over and loops back into the Pentagon. It slices in at an angle, leaving a deadly and ugly gash in the nation's military nerve center. And finally, 8 a.m., out of Newark Airport, United's Flight 93, a 757 with 45 aboard, bound Newark to San Francisco, hijacked as well. But crashes short of whatever its intended target is, comes down in rural western Pennsylvania. Eyewitnesses there. And I heard a loud noise, and I happened to look up, and it was a plane, it was real low to me. It sounded like it was running fine to me. I just kept watching, I watched it go nosedive straight into the ground. You could see where the plane had made the initial impact in the ground, and it was still on fire. It made a crater probably 30 feet by 30 feet, and it's probably 15 or 20 feet deep, and uh, there's just debris scattered within probably a half a mile radius. There are only two ways terrorists can sneak themselves or their weapons aboard planes, either through passenger screening or by going unscreened through locked doors into off-limits areas or onto the tarmac. Periodic FAA tests have found plenty of flaws. Found when government agents tried to sneak into secure areas, they were successful more than two-thirds of the time. Found testers also often able to sneak fake guns and explosives by X-ray screening. Once aboard, many speculate the hijackers must have disabled crews and taken over the plane's controls. More likely that than forcing a pilot with a gun at his head to fly right into the World Trade Center, for instance. Former American Airlines pilot Jim Tillman. It is inconceivable to me that any airline pilot would allow anyone to force him to fly into an inhabited building. I cannot imagine how any pilot could be conscious or capable of doing anything to control that airplane at the time that it was directed at one of these buildings. Terrorism specialist Neil Livingstone. I suspect that what we're going to find is that the pilots were overwhelmed, uh, per perhaps dead already, and that trained pilots uh, uh, from the hijacker camp were in charge of those aircraft and were willing to die for their beliefs. If there was time, if there was, the crews may have been able to press a button in the cockpit and send out a coded warning to controllers that there was a hijack in progress. Controllers may then have radioed back inquiries, but if the crews were disabled, the controllers would have been left in the dark for real information. Whatever else, controllers must have been surprised, in disbelief. There hadn't been a commercial plane hijacked in the U.S. for 10 years, since 1991, and now this. 
There are several unconfirmed reports around that give little glimmers of what may have been going on in the cockpits. There's one from a controller in New Hampshire who says that a microphone was left on in the first plane of the day that was hijacked, that the pilot had his microphone keyed, so it was picking up the, uh, what was going on in the cockpit, and that the controller then, uh, off at the control center in New Hampshire, heard a terrorist say in English, don't do anything foolish. Then after that, the microphone went dead. The transponder of the plane went off. That's a device that uh, radios uh, information out to the radar so controllers could only watch the blip they could no longer tell what altitude the plane was at there were several cell phone calls from relatives on board uh, planes that who reached their relative on the ground one reported the terrorists had knife-like instruments and there was one unconfirmed report that an American Airlines flight attendant actually reached her company to say that terrorists had killed the crew of her plane Whatever else, we may know some more from the cockpit voice recorders, which could have survived those crashes and would give us an actual recording of what was going on uh, for audio in the cockpits. Tom? Thanks very much, NBC's Robert Hager. At the Pentagon right now, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Henry Schultz. Let's hear what he has to say. Our intense focus on recovery and helping the injured and the families of those who were killed is matched only by our determination to prevent more attacks and matched only by our unity to track down, root out, and relentlessly pursue terrorists, states that support them, and harbor them. They are the common enemy of the civilized world. Our institutions are strong, and our unity is palpable. Senator John Warner. Thank you. As a past chairman, that is a preceding Carl Levin, General Shelton, who is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, talking about the institution strong and our unity is strong as war. We are on a war footing, in effect, in this country even though there has been no official declaration of any kind. But from a military point of view, political point of view, and certainly from a psychological point of view, we are at war with these terrorists. The question is, who are they? Within the intelligence community, all the fingers are pointing at Osama bin Laden, the very wealthy Saudi dissident who has been harbored by the Taliban, it's widely believed, in Afghanistan. Let's get more tonight on the continuing speculation about who is responsible from NBC's Andrea Mitchell now on her, at her post in the nation's capital. Andrea? Tom, tonight U.S. intelligence officials are mobilizing worldwide to try to find the culprits and make sure that they don't strike again. An attack on America coordinated with military precision, four planes, split-second timing, penetration of airports and airspace, no warning. They can destroy buildings, they can kill people, and we will be saddened by this tragedy, but they will never be allowed to kill the spirit of democracy. They cannot destroy our society. They cannot destroy our belief in the democratic way. The first question tonight, is it over? The terrible answer, despite billions spent on U.S. intelligence, the nation's top experts do not know where or when terrorists will strike next. The problem is, that uh, they are hard to penetrate. Uh, they are located in places that we're very hard pressed to, to get any kind of information out of. And as hard as our agencies have tried, they've had some success. You don't hear about that. We only hear about the failure. Who could have done this? Before today, the worst failure, the attack on two U.S. embassies in Africa three years ago. Again, perfectly timed, no warning, 224 dead. The alleged mastermind, America's most wanted terrorist, Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden also involved, U.S. officials say, in helping the man convicted of bombing the World Trade Center, Ramzi Youssef, nine years ago, by protecting Youssef before and after that attack. Last winter, CIA Director George Tenet told Congress that bin Laden is capable of multiple attacks with little or no warning. Osama bin Laden and his global network of lieutenants and associates remain the most immediate and serious threat. Bin Laden's alleged millennium plots planned attacks on three tourist areas in Jordan frequented by Americans, on Los Angeles International Airport, and on a U.S. destroyer in Yemen, all foiled. 
But six months later, terrorists do strike successfully, ram another destroyer, the USS Cole, killing 17. In June, bin Laden brags on this home video of killing U.S. sailors, a remarkable tape made to recruit more terrorists against America. And just three weeks ago, a warning to a London newspaper, allegedly from bin Laden's group, that he was targeting America again. I think it is a dilemma for the United States now. I believe the only thing is you know, to, to uh, revise their policies, to uh, look at what's happening, why, for example, the anti-American sentiment is very high in the Middle East and in the Muslim wars. How could this happen? Only from a massive intelligence failure. But in this case, at least there will be some evidence. The good news is that the uh, 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 hijacking four airplanes is a very complicated operation. Even hijacking one is complicated. And they will have left some trail behind them. They will have had to have checked in. And they will have had to have purchased tickets either under their name or alias names. If the U.S. cracks the case, how will it retaliate? Current and former officials say massively, but carefully. If we're going to act, we need to be able to convince the world that we were justified in our actions. We had that evidence during the uh, African uh, embassy bombings, and I think it's critical that the uh, intelligence community now begin to develop that with respect to these attacks. Today, Afghanistan's Taliban leaders deny any involvement by Osama bin Laden. But as David Bloom alluded to earlier, intelligence officials and others are telling NBC tonight that they are 90% sure that bin Laden is involved. And Tom, if that proves to be the case, there is no doubt in anyone's mind that the U.S. will retaliate. But um, the question is, how do they find o Osama bin Laden and who do they retaliate against? They cannot find Osama bin Laden. They have not been able to. He is uh, number one on the most wanted list of the FBI. They have warned the Taliban that they will respond against a Afghanistan's leaders. So the attack would be against Afghanistan. Within the last three weeks, they have warned Afghanistan that they will hold the Taliban personally responsible if Osama bin Laden attacks the United States. Andrea, already there is talk about a massive intelligence failure. It's not so much the blame game as much as it is that this could happen again. There have been a number of red flags that have gone up for years now, but even in Washington at the highest political levels, people have refused to take them as seriously as this day indicates they should have. Exactly right. I mean, in our report, uh, Senator Warren Rudman, former senator, you spoke to him earlier live earlier today. He and Gary Hart, another former senator, had a blue uh, panel commission, a blue ribbon commission. They warned that the nation's defense, the national defense here at home, not overseas, is the greatest vulnerability. That was in February and March. Not much has been done. The bureaucracy moved so slowly, and after the 1998 bombings, Tom, America's embassies were not uh, greatly enhanced in their security, partially, but Congress rejected demands by two secretaries of state to beef up security to a much greater level overseas. Thank you very much, NBC's Andrea Mitchell. The United States, at once so powerful and so innocent in its worldview in so many ways. Let's go to our Pentagon correspondent now, NBC's Jim Mikloshevsky. Jim, you have some information for us about why these particular targets might have been chosen. Well, these particular targets, first of all, the World Trade Center for its very high profile and the obvious uh, trap that the terrorists set. After the first attack, they knew very well that all television cameras in one of the most media intensive centers of the world would be focused on those twin towers so that when that second plane came in with that horrific video of it striking the second tower, that would achieve a monumental victory for them. The target here, obvious, the most powerful, the center of the most powerful military in the world. Tom? All right, thanks, uh, NBC Jim Mikloshevsky. I'm told that Marine One, the helicopter bearing the president from Andrews Air Force Base back to the White House now, is uh, landing on the White House lawn. We do expect to hear from the president before the end of this night. He has had a long and challenging day beginning in Florida, then going to Louisiana, and then to Offutt Air Force Base, the home of the Strategic Air Command, before returning here to his office at the White House this evening. Uh, he'll be meeting with his national security advisors by then, Colin Powell, the Secretary of State, may be back from his trip to Peru. Also, Condoleezza Rice, who's been in the White House all day long and informed him of all of this. And uh, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, uh, Vice President Dick Cheney, who has managed to stay in the White House, too. These are the kinds of days that you know in the back of your mind may occur when you become 
the President of the United States and the Commander-in-Chief when you're on the campaign trail, but the cold, hard reality has been visited on this President, one of the greatest national security crises this country has faced in many, many years within his first year in office. So let's just watch for a moment and see if we can not see the President uh, as he gets off the helicopter and then under very heavy guard. There is extraordinary uh, security now at the White House. There's sharpshooters on the roof, people have been cleared out. Our correspondents are operating from across the street. We'll see whether we can uh, see him as he moves from Marine One into the Oval Office. Mick, we had, uh, as we expected earlier today, uh, the president had a fighter plane escort coming from Omaha back to Washington, and my guess is that he must have had one earlier today when he left Florida and also when he went from Louisiana up to SAC. Jim Lee, it was shortly after the attacks occurred on the World Trade Center that the Pentagon went into a crisis mode. Uh, they were trying to establish exactly what additional threats there may be, and then it was just about uh, oh, 28 minutes after that that the airplane hit here. It was after the attack on the Pentagon that the Air Force then decided to scramble F-16s out of the D.C. National Guard, Andrews Air Force Base, to fly cover, uh, a protective cover over Washington, D.C. It was something straight out of a war zone, Tom. One Air Force officer standing next to me looking up in the sky at the F-16 said, my God, we're flying cover on the nation's capital. All right, Jim, let's continue to watch here as the, the president still is on Marine One. Uh, we do expect that momentarily he'll be exiting that helicopter uh, and moving briskly into the Oval Office. Laura Bush, he had talked to earlier today. She had been moved to a secure location. His brother Jeb Bush declared a state of emergency in the state of Florida after the president left today, a contingency that a lot of governors took around the country. Secret Service detail exiting first. There were Secret Service offices and a number of other uh, government offices in the World Trade Center. There's the president now walking to what will prove to be one of the longest and most important nights of his presidency. Back into the White House Oval Office. We do expect him to address the nation later. His father, obviously, was president during the Operation Desert Storm, the Persian Gulf War. His father had been the ambassador to the United Nations, director of the CIA, and vice president of the United States for eight years before he occupied the Oval Office. There is very little uh, in your experience as governor of Texas or even as a senator of the United States or almost any other job to prepare you for these kinds of occasions. Let's go to NBC's Campbell Brown. Campbell, what can you tell us about the plans for tonight? Well, Tom, we're not sure as of yet exactly what time the president will be addressing the nation, uh, but now that we knew, do know that he is back at the White House, he will likely be joining the vice president and the national security advisor, Condoleezza Rice, in a room, what's referred to as the Situation Room in the White House. This is a wood-paneled room, extremely secure, in the basement of the West Wing. And in that room is a giant conference room around a big table. There are 10 chairs. There are about 20 chairs around the perimeter of the room, and there are two giant video screens that can open up where the president and his team can meet and essentially watch all of the communications coming in from around the country, there, or around the world, rather. Right next to that conference room is a special communications center where four people are on staff 24 hours a day, military, State Department, intelligence, who are sifting through all the cables, all the information, providing them instantly to the president and his team. That's where the vice president's been all day with the national security advisor and other key personnel. In all likelihood, the president is joining, there now, joining them there now to get an update before he addresses the nation. Tom. All right, thanks very much, NBC's Campbell Brown. And at his side, he will have veterans of other crises in the national security of this country. 
Vice President Dick Cheney was Defense Secretary during the Persian Gulf War. Donald Rumsfeld uh, served as Defense Secretary before and also as White House Chief of Staff. Condoleezza Rice has been on the staff of the National Security Council during President George Herbert Walker Bush's uh, administration, uh, President 41 Bush, as they like to describe him. Now back here in New York, as you can see behind me, the billowing smoke, the continuing dust and debris from the collapse of the World Trade Center earlier today, and then Trade Center number seven, a 40-story building that went down. But the World Trade Center, one of the targets of the, of the terrorists today, is one of the most distinctive uh, architectural edifices in the world. The world's largest commercial complex, completed in 1976, an architectural marvel, its details immense. A massive twin structure, 110 stories tall, built of 600,000 square feet of glass and 200,000 tons of steel, 1,350 feet tall, 43,000 windows, 99 elevators, and a home for 1,200 businesses. Businesses where 50,000 people work. Businesses that include commodity exchanges, investment firms, law firms, banks, restaurants, a hotel, government offices, atop an observation deck, a renowned tourist attraction. The Trade Center could draw 90,000 additional visitors on a busy day. Today, the Twin Towers Many of those inside, gone. That's just one of the many reasons, of course, that today will be remembered as one of the worst days in the nearly 400-year history of the great city of New York. And NBC's Pat Dawson has been on the streets of New York, very near the World Trade Center throughout most of the day. He's been witness to the heroic rescue efforts that were affected there today. And of course, tonight, Pat, still an unknown number of dead trapped there in the rubble. It's very true, Tom. Police, fire, and emergency workers first on the scene this morning knew they had a catastrophe of unprecedented proportions. What they didn't realize is that after they arrived, it would get worse and that many of them would be victims as well. Within minutes of the attack, New York rescue crews responded. Dozens of emergency workers running headlong into the chaos, a swirling mass of fire and smoke more than 60 stories up. Chief Albert Turry of the New York Fire Department was one of the first on the scene. The initial reaction was that it was an absolute terrorist attack. His job, direct a rescue effort inside the Trade Center. His team of 200 firefighters fanned out into the burning towers to search for survivors. When that first tower fell, I was trying to evacuate everybody three blocks north, away from every high-rise building in the area. But when the towers started crumbling, crashing all around them, the original rescue effort became an exercise in survival, the rescuers themselves running for their lives. But I'm telling you right now, there wasn't time to evacuate our people. Most of those that did make it out of the Trade Center covered in debris, ghostly figures coughing and vomiting from the smoke and dust. It was the most horrific scene I've ever seen in my whole life. Uh, we saw the, the uh, World Trade Center uh, in flames, a big gaping hole all the way on the top of it. We could see people jumping from the top of the building. At midday, the financial district of Lower Manhattan looks like a war zone. With no idea if another attack is imminent, hundreds of companies throughout New York send their workers home. Bridges and tunnels across the Hudson River are closed. Mass transit shut down. There are over 1,000 rescue workers, probably about 2,000 that are deployed, trying to get into the buildings, trying to find people, trying to search for people. But the governor and I spoke a couple of hours ago, the governor has deployed the National Guard to relieve them because our, our people are going to need reinforcement pretty, pretty soon. But right now they don't want to leave because they're searching, they're searching for innocent citizens and they're searching for some of, their, some of their brothers and sisters. When rescuers finally got inside the trade towers, the damage left many of them shocked at the near total devastation. There's no way to estimate casualties. Thousands are believed dead. For those used to saving lives, the frustration is overwhelming. When you start talking to a New York police officer and they start crying uh, for what they've seen in the last couple hours, you know the seriousness and the gravity of the situation. Throughout the day, rescuers have faced a terrible choice with hundreds, perhaps thousands of people trapped in the rubble in there. When is it safe to go back in? 
And Tom, the most vivid example of that referred to by David Bloom a little while ago, that of course the loss of Building 7 of the World Trade Center just over my shoulder, which tumbled to the ground eight hours after this attack began. Tom? NBC's Pat Dawson in Lower Manhattan tonight, and of course for many of the people who lived through all of that, it will be one of the unforgettable moments of their lives. NBC's Ann Thompson was in the vicinity of the World Trade Center when the buildings began to come down. Ann? Tom, this is the view tonight down West Broadway. Smoke's filling the air where the two towers in building number seven stood. In the last hour, we have seen busloads of police, of doctors, and ambulance after ambulance go into that area to try to repair a city that's been mortally wounded by this attack. A direct hit that shattered New York City's confidence. Well, as soon as the first building collapsed, everybody made a mad dash to, uh, to just take cover. And everybody just started running. I just happened to duck running to the post office. As soon as we got out of the train station, people were screaming and crying and yelling. and It was just total chaos. And the bottom of our building was blown out. For me, Ground Zero, Fulton and Broadway, about two blocks from the World Trade Center, just as the South Tower crumbled. Hollywood could never imagine something like this. A tidal wave of smoke and debris came roaring down Broadway. I was standing on, at the corner of Fulton and Broadway. I ran into a building, ran between a column and a building at 195 Broadway and pushed my face and my body into that building. For what seemed like five minutes, I was pelted with all kinds of debris. I crouched down, was coughing, trying to breathe. You couldn't get any air. The, the air was so full of smoke and dust. When it finally settled, I stood up. My glasses were covered with dust. Hours later, I'm still covered with dust. The building that I was in front of, 195 Broadway, the doors were gated shut. They opened the doors, let us in, and inside we were finally able to breathe. It wasn't easy. My eyes were filled with dust. My mouth was filled with dust. We, I was choking. The people I was with were choking. It was just absolutely horrific. All I could think of was, this is war. I just heard the rumble, and then, then a, a, I ran like hell, and there was a large wind coming. Down here, panic. Survivors flee by whatever means they can, fearing more destruction at any moment. At 10.30, I tried to leave the building, but as soon as I got outside, I heard a second explosion and another rumble and more smoke and more dust. I ran inside the buildings. The chandelier shook, and again, black smoke filled the air. Within another five minutes, we were covered again with more silt and more dust. And then a fire marshal came in and said we had to leave because if there was a third explosion, this building might not last. Everyone, please clear the corner. Palpable fear as people run through the streets, choking on dust and debris. You gotta chase it. Come on, let's go, let's go. We were saw the building come down. We all ran and the walkway held up save like 40 or 50 of us that were right there. We were buried there and then a uh, cop shot out windows in the next building. It was the only thing that was in front of us was of like these one inch windows. The streets of the financial district covered with debris, in some cases ankle deep. Cars on fire, cars just turned by the force of the explosions. It was like something no one had ever seen. Panic, like smoke, heads uptown. Officials ordering precautionary evacuations of some of New York City's landmarks. This is an orderly evacuation of 30 Rockefeller Plaza. On the street, anxious commuters trying to call home, cell phone service dead. At Grand Central Station, travelers desperate to get out of the city. It's going to take a long time, but you're going to see Mama and Papa today, okay? Outside the station, a surreal scene. People buying postcards of the Twin Towers that no longer exist. As the day wears on, witnesses who survived the attack now face a new horror, searching for missing friends and co-workers. We can't account for all of our employees. We have, we're just in a, in a state of shock. The biggest, busiest city in the world, the attack revives fears of the 1993 bombing. Suddenly, nowhere in the financial district seems safe. Did you ever think this could happen again? No, I really didn't. I lived through the first one. After a tragedy so great, tonight a city comes together, searching for safety and comfort. 
Tom, now this area is more than just a business district. It is also where people live. And within the last hour, we have seen families bringing suitcases, crates carrying the fa their family pets to leave and to go elsewhere. They have no water, they have no gas, and there is also the fear that more buildings will collapse. The area is covered by police from all over New York City, and they tell us that they will be here through the night. Tom? All right, thanks very much, uh, NBC's Ann Thompson. But let me ask you, after you finally emerged from that building, what about other people who could not get into a building? What kind of casualties did you see? Tom, I, I will tell you that when I walked out of the building on Broadway and headed down towards Canal, it was, it was as if there had been a blizzard of debris and dust all over the street. I saw people running. I was walking. There were a lot of rescue people there, but there were people injured. We, I saw a woman being carried by two men. It was, it was like something I had, I had never seen anything like it. And all I could think of was just to get away from there, to get to safety. And as I kept walking to Canal Street, I could hear yet another explosion behind me. It was truly one of the most frightening moments I've ever lived through. Thanks very much, NBC's Ann Thompson. Any number of NBC News personnel were caught in all of that today. Among them, our producer, Mary Beth O'Toole, and correspondent, Rahema Ellis. And they provided us tonight with a kind of a video diary. We'd like to share that with you now. Well, we'll hope to get back to Rahima Ellis. Obviously, we're having some difficulty with uh, what, what has been going on uh, with the audio part of our broadcast tonight uh, in that particular videotape. Uh, this is a live picture looking across New York Harbor. And uh, I'll ask your forbearance and patience here because we are doing the very best we can under, as you might expect, some very trying circumstances. That's looking across from the other side, from the New Jersey side at uh, the lower end of Manhattan. That is a picture that has been going on all day, but when it began, there were the two 110-story towers of the World Trade Center. They are now gone from the Manhattan skyline. It's still a stunning thought to realize that they have been brought down so coldly and so efficiently in such a cold-blooded fashion by these hijacked airliners in this terrorist attack. Another colleague who captured some of the most horrifying moments today is Christian Martin. He's a native New Yorker and he's a producer at Dateline. He had his own camera with him when the buildings began to come down. And, uh, I saw a tourist with a video camera, so I said, uh, you know, let me buy that from you. I took a shot of a huge wheel of a plane lying in the middle of the avenue. There was all these sort of white sheets in the, in the middle of the street, which took me a minute to figure out what those were. I mean, the collapse happened 10 minutes after I got the camera. I shot a couple of shots of the building burning. I was shooting the building, and the building started to collapse. And that happens pretty slowly. Everyone gets into the job for adventure. This, uh, this turns sour pretty fast. Um, you know, I was down in Oklahoma City, and I got there about four hours afterwards, and that was pretty chaotic. This was uh, about a thousand times worse and more chaotic than that. And then, you know, the cop was like, run, run, to save my life. I had literally a mouthful of soot. Uh, you couldn't see. It was just... And then people were just remarkable, you know? I mean, everyone was just in a horrible, horrible place. You couldn't see. Everyone was hurt. I was... So lucky, so lucky, so much luckier than so many other people. I mean, you just cannot overemphasize how many completely innocent, beautiful people were just, you know, destroyed by this. One of our producers, Christian Bernard, tonight in his own words, he was there in the middle of it. Uh, Christian Martin is a producer for Dateline. He managed to buy a camera from a tourist and then almost lost his life as he was trying to record what was going on down there. 
We want to tell you that momentarily we do expect to hear from the Attorney General of the United States, John Ashcroft, who does have supervisory responsibility for the FBI. He's our chief law enforcement officer. And also from the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Tommy Thompson, the former governor of Wisconsin. He'll be deal dealing with a lot of the relief that is going on. Behind me, you can see the dusk is now beginning to settle over the city of New York. And uh, the billowing smoke is still emanating from the lower part of Manhattan, the site of what was once uh, two uh, towers, each 110 stories high. 20,000 people, we believe, are in them at that time when they were attacked today. And the 40-story Seven Trade Center now missing from the Manhattan skyline. We're going to see if we can't get Rahema Ellis back. She was with Mary Beth O'Toole today. They had a kind of a video diary. So let's join that now. We may have to come out of it as we go to Attorney General Ashcroft. But let's hear from Rahema. New York City's Brooklyn Bridge, normally clogged with vehicles, today an escape route. It's 11.45 in the morning, and there is a mass exodus from downtown New York City. You can take a look, and you can see hundreds of thousands of people leaving the area. These heinous acts of violence are an assault on the security of our nation. They're an assault on the security and the freedom of every American citizen. We will not tolerate such acts. We will expend every effort and devote all the necessary resources to bring the people responsible for these acts, these crimes, to justice. Now is the time for us to come together as a nation to offer our support, our prayers for victims and for their families, for the rescue workers, for law enforcement officials, for every one of us that has been changed forever by this horrible tragedy. The following is a summary of the known facts surrounding today's incidents. American Airlines Flight 11 departed Boston for Los Angeles, hijacked by suspects armed with knives. This plane crashed into the World Trade Center. United Airlines Flight 175 departed Boston for Los Angeles, was hijacked and crashed into the World Trade Center. American Airlines Flight 77 departed Washington Dulles for Los Angeles, was hijacked and crashed into the Pentagon. United Airlines Flight 93 departed Newark for San Francisco, was hijacked and crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Crime scenes have been established by the federal authorities in New York, in Washington, D.C. area, in Pittsburgh, in Boston, and in Newark. The full resources of the Department of Justice, including the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, the U.S. Attorney's Offices, the U.S. Marshals Service, the Bureau of Prisons, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and the Office of Justice programs are being deployed to investigate these crimes and to assist survivors and victim families. Thousands of FBI agents in all of the field offices across the country and in the international legat offices, assisted by personnel from other Department of Justice agencies, are cooperating in this investigation. The FBI has established a website where people can report any information about these crimes. That address is www.ifccfbi.gov. That address again, www.ifccfbi.gov. Individuals can report any information they know about these crimes to that website. It takes courage for individuals to come forward in situations like this, and I urge anyone with information that may be useful and helpful to authorities to use this opportunity. The Office of Victims of Crime has established a toll-free 800 number for family and friends of victims. They can call 800 331 0075 
to leave contact information for a future time when more information is available, to find out information about a victim or to find out information about the rights of victims and the services available to victim survivors and victim families. The determination of these terrorists will not deter the determination of the American people. We are survivors and freedom is a survivor. A free American people will not be intimidated, nor will we be defeated. We will find the people responsible for these cowardly acts, and justice will be done. Tommy. Every single American lost something today. And every one of us at this time expresses our deepest sympathy to the victims of today's tragedies and their families. It is now our mission to begin the healing from this tragedy. From the moment that we learned of these attacks, the Department of Health and Human Services has begun readying teams and resources to be sent to New York City and the Washington area to meet any needs of state and local officials. So far, we have sent four disaster medical teams to New York City and three of these disaster medical teams to the Washington, Northern Virginia, Baltimore area. These medical teams each consist of about 35 physicians, nurses, and emergency medical technicians. They are all trained to deal with traumatic injuries and other emergency needs. We've also sent four disaster mortuary operational response teams to New York and three to the greater Washington area. We're also in the process of shipping a great deal of emergency medical supplies to New York City with the help of the Centers for Disease Control. In short, we're making the full force of the Department of Health and Human Services, both its resources and medical expertise available to the areas that need our assistance. We've also this afternoon activated the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps, which consists of approximately 6,000 health professionals. We also are giving backup assistance to the 500-bed ship Comfort from the United States Navy. Americans all over are calling up and asking what they can do. The best thing they can do is respond to this great call by volunteering to give blood. We need Americans to continue to answer that call. No matter where you live, please do your civic duty and assist us by donating blood. It is our primary job is to make sure Americans harmed by this tragedy get the help that they need. We will remain in constant contact with the governors, the mayors, public health officials, and other local officials to make sure that all their needs are being met. It is a sad day, but America and all of its citizens certainly share tonight in the grief that it's been caused. And as the president and everybody in his administration have said, we, the government, will continue to operate and continue to provide the services to all Americans. Secretary of Health and Human Services Tommy Thompson with John Ashcroft, who is the Attorney General of the United States, talking about the role of the federal government now in tracking down those people who are responsible for today's attacks and then the process of healing physically and psychologically and politically this country. Big part of the story today, the medical response. Witnesses kept saying the scene today was like a war zone. In fact, one of the rescue workers said, I spent a year in combat. I never saw anything quite like all of this. New York area has first-rate medical facilities, and many of them, and NBC's Robert Bazell was at one of them today, and he joins us now. Robert? Tom, within minutes of the first explosion, thousands of doctors and nurses at hundreds of hospitals around the New York City area responded with emergency plans to the biggest medical crisis this city has ever faced. 
At the scene of the explosions and building collapse, emergency workers set up triage sites to put the dead aside and move the most critically wounded to area hospitals. The closest trauma center to the World Trade Center is St. Vincent's in New York's Greenwich Village. A steady stream of ambulances began minutes after the explosion and continued through the day with many kinds of injuries. Uh, several fractures, uh, several patients have already been to the operating room, and because of the intense uh, fire and smoke, multiple patients with inhalation injuries, uh, and they're being monitored in critical care units. Medical staff stood prepared to meet each ambulance, some carrying many injuries. This one hospital sent out a call for blood donors, and within minutes, so many volunteers appeared that the hospital was swamped and arranged for buses to take donors to other hospitals. What if you know you're just oh and you're not sure whether you're negative or positive? More than 400 casualties were taken across the Hudson River to hospitals in New Jersey and Staten Island. What next? Oh my God. Among the first casualties, about one in five were rescue workers, firefighters, police, and EMS technicians involved in the rescue effort. Many of the rescuers, hardened by years of tragedies, said they had never seen anything as bad. They turned in tonight for about uh, two or three minutes and uh, took an inventory of myself and went about. As of late this evening, the total number of casualties taken to all area hospitals stands near 1,000. And that number is very low because rescue workers expect that there are still thousands of people buried underneath all of that rubble. And all of the doctors and nurses expect that they are going to be treating casualties from the rubble for several days to come. Tom? All right, thanks very much, NBC's Robert Bazell tonight. Now let's go back to Washington. It was a scene of the third hit, of course, a direct hit on the emblem of American military power, the Pentagon, the headquarters for our military services. An estimated 100 casualties there on the ground, 64 were on the plane that hit it, including a prominent Washington lawyer. NBC's Jim Mikloshevsky. Uh, well, before we get to that, we're going to go to the congressional leadership. Jim, if you'll just stand by at the Pentagon, Jim Mikloshevsky, we'll be coming back to you momentarily. Let's go now to the Hill, and Tom Daschle is the Senate Majority Leader. To justice, we, Republicans and Democrats, House and Senate, stand strongly united behind the President and will work together to ensure that the full resources of the government are brought to bear in these efforts. Our heartfelt thoughts and our fervent prayers are with the injured and the families of those who have been lost. That's now, House Speaker, Dennis Pastor, who's third in line in succession. We know as a nation, as we said, our thoughts and prayers are with those families and those injured and those who are the casualties of today's attack. We also remember those thousands of people who are rescue workers. We ask now that we all bow our heads in a moment of silence and remembrance. Thank you. A, a rare and welcome bipartisan gathering of the uh, Republican and Democratic leadership of the United States Senate and the House of Representatives. This is wild. On the steps of the U.S. Capitol, men and women, black, 
white and Asian, conservatives and liberals and independents from all corners of this country, a spontaneous demonstration of unity, a declaration of support for the President of the United States, and a very important symbolic message to be sending around the world and to this country at this hour. NBC's Tim Russert is our Washington Bureau Chief. Tim, uh, Washington has been riven in recent years by petty political divisions, but this is bound to have a big impact on the ability of Congress, the Senate, and the and the House of Representatives to say nothing of the other political players in this country to find common ground. Tom, the rancor and partisanship in Washington disappeared immediately. Such national unity as just demonstrated in the steps of the Capitol. Remember, 24 hours ago, it was the Bush tax cut, the Bush budget, the Bush economy. You don't hear any of that tonight. It's America's enemy. America is under attack. Tomorrow, the Congress will convene almost an act of defiance saying, we are here standing strong, Democrats and Republicans arm in arm. It's a very, very important message, not only for the world and the terrorists, but for our own nation as well. And it's quite welcome, frankly, by many people who've been covering a Congress, co constantly bickering with one another, almost every issue. Tonight, they have found, in a very tragic way, a common bond, because out of the necessity of protecting our country and our values. Thanks very much, NBC's Tim Russert. Every generation of politicians has, in its own way, Tim, a test of its steel and its strength and its long view for this country. But I think that it's worth also pointing out that whatever happens in Washington in the next several days, that America is going to be changed by the events of this day. Let's go to NBC Jim Kloshevsky now, who is at the uh, Pentagon across the uh, river, of course, from the nation's capital. He was there in his office this morning when he heard an explosion and told us immediately he didn't know for sure what it was. We later learned, of course, Jim, it was the unthinkable, a hijacked airliner that had crashed into that building. Back here, fresh flames are flickering from the roof of the building. Uh, rescue workers continue to search the bombed out portion of the Pentagon. Uh, uh, it's believed that scores of dead are still buried beneath the rubble. No exact death toll has been yet released here, but a temporary morgue has been set up at the courtyard at the center of the Pentagon complex. And the dead. This was the second target in a well-coordinated act of terrorism. At 9.15, after the second plane hits the World Trade Center, the Pentagon puts together a crisis action team to assess any additional threats. 9.30, American Airlines Flight 77, a Boeing 757 with 62 people on board, takes off from Dulles Airport for Los Angeles. Believed hijacked, it heads instead for the Pentagon. 9.38, Flying low alongside the Pentagon, it banks sharply 90 degrees, flips on its right side, and slams into the Pentagon's lower two floors on the southwest side, exploding on impact as horrified commuters watch. I saw a plane going down, big plane, commercial liner type, going down full speed and just inside the, the side of the Pentagon. That's Panicked low. employees evacuate by the thousands. The plane slices deep into the lower Pentagon, leaving a gaping black hole of destruction. The upper floors later...